So here's the setup. In Marbury versus Madison, the Supreme Court claimed the power of judicial review, which is to say the power to take the text of the Constitution, read the words of the Constitution, uh, and interpret them as they would a law. And if they found that an act of the legislature, state or national, as in the case of Marbury, violated the Constitution or exceeded the scope of power, was enacted in, uh, outside the scope of power of, of the enacting body, then they could invalidate it. Say that statute's unenforceable, that statute's void, it's unconstitutional, is what they would say. So that's a pretty, it's a pretty serious, um, it's a pretty serious power, right, in a republic. Uh, and so the, the follow-up question uh, has and ought to be, well, well, how often do they use this? And, and what do they use it for? And it, and it turns out that over the trajectory of our history, the judicial review power has been used more and more frequently by the court, by the federal courts, to invalidate acts of both the federal legislature and the state legislatures and municipalities and local governments, et cetera, in a whole lot of really important areas. Alexis de Tocqueville, a uh, young French guy who came over with a friend in the uh, Jacksonian era to uh, study the American prison system, uh, got distracted by what he saw in the experiment in self-governance and ended up writing this massive and massively interesting book that some of you have, have read or have read at called Democracy in America. Uh, and de Tocqueville saw the value of, of this exercise of the judicial review power to the preservation of our system of government and noted that even at that early state, it appeared that, and this is a quote, there is virtually no political question in the United States that does not sooner or later resolve itself into a judicial question. Uh, and I should, should say that I think that's, that's partly due to uh, the, the, the eventual widespread popular acceptance of the notion of judicial review and also due to uh, legislative laziness. Um, you know, members of Congress, are, this is my own view, but members of Congress are also uh, have uh, a, 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 an obligation to uphold the Constitution as, as does the President. They all swear an oath of office. Uh, and so one could argue that they ought to be looking at legislation they're considering and deciding whether it's constitutional or not in their judgment before they pass it based on their reading of the Constitution. But lots of times we'll see members of Congress faced with popular uh, piece of legislation that may or may not be constitutional thinking, oh, the hell with it, I'll pass it. I vote my constituents will like it and then we'll let the courts figure out uh, whether it's constitutional or not and they can take the heat if they invalidate it, that's a win-win, right? And so, and that's human nature, but that's, that's part of, I think, what's resulted in the judicial branch getting all these. The judicial branch, as was discussed earlier, the federal judiciary, non-elected, they've got tenure for life, they're really, really hard to get rid of. They've only had one Supreme Court justice impeached, Samuel Chase, and that was an unsuccessful attempt. So those folks can say anything they want to, at least in theory. Now, so, most major political questions go to the court. The court's going to decide whether the, the, they're constitutional or not. Uh, so that's powerful. What hesitation might we have? Uh, we've talked about benefits. They're unelected, so they can make these calls. But you stop and think about it, and this usually kicks in about a minute after the court issues an opinion with which we disagree. Um, hey, who, who are these people anyway? Why does this group of nine or six or five or seven or what's varied at different times in history, why do they get to decide what the Constitution means? Who voted for them? Uh, you know, what do they know? Uh, at certain points, we've had decisions come out of the court that were so unpopular that they get widely dismissed in the press. We've lived through a number of them. Um, Dred Scott, I'll mention, that gave rise to the famous quote, that the Dred Scott, uh, the opinion of Chief Justice Taney was entitled to just as much deference as the opinion of any nine drunks in a Washington bar room or something similar to that. Um, so there's, so there's, there's a risk that comes when the court exercises its judicial review power and reaches a decision that's not particularly popular. Now, so what this has inspired, I believe, this concern for the preservation of institutional respect 
uh, legitimacy of the, uh, of the sort of judicial infrastructure, the powerful judicial infrastructure, with at its centerpiece the power of judicial review that Chief Justice John Marshall created. Uh, essential uh, to that is, is a fairly delicate political balancing act. Uh, the court uh, doesn't simply, it could, but it doesn't simply issue decisions, a decision or a judgment, rather. Uh, it doesn't simply say, uh, you win, and then go about its business. Or, or you, now you win, kind of, but you sort of win. And here's, so here's what you have to do. And th so that's the result. Instead, it, it gives us opinions along with the judgments, and often more than one opinion. Used to be, interestingly, in the, this is true for the, for, it's true for the British system, that almost every justice would issue his own opinion. They were called seriatim opinions. Jefferson loved this idea. What this meant was you knew who won in a, different, in a particular case. You had no idea why they won, which kept the judicial branch fairly weak. Um, there, there, the lower courts had no idea what the rule to follow was because every judge had a different rationale for the result in the case, so the lower court judges could start over from scratch. John Marshall said, we're not doing that anymore. I, I, we're going to write one opinion. Um, he did this. This is a bit of an aside, but by getting everybody to live together and banning spouses <laughs> from Washington, so there are no distractions. You're all in the same boarding house. There's a fairly healthy and interesting literature on this. Uh, and uh, so, you know, so we're all going to agree eventually. And in the major cases, he would write the opinion himself. Uh, and it would be one opinion for the whole court. And that was the, the rule for a long time in the early 19th century. And through that method, the court became much more powerful than it had been. Speaking with one voice, this is why this decision is coming down the way it is. And this is what everybody has to do from now on, all the lower courts and everybody else who's reading this. It's not just the parties who are, who are, uh, who are affected by this. So, so what does that mean? Well, the long opinion is going to explain the rationale. Um, that's the way that the court gives instructions to lower court judgments, uh, lower, lower courts. But at the same time, it, it's, a, it's a public document. So it, it's giving information to us, the mass of citizens who aren't lower court judges, lower court uh, federal judges who are invested in the system. And when we read it, and the court figured this out fairly early, some of us, especially those of us who don't agree with the, with the judgment, with the result, are going to say, wait a minute, and, and we're back to where I was a minute ago. Who are these people? This doesn't make any sense to me. So the court has, over the years, had to come up with some way, essentially, to, you can say this two different ways, to exercise its judicial review power responsibly and to sell itself to the citizenry. Because it's an undemocratic institution, we're a little bit suspicious for good Democrats, right? Little d. But, uh, but we're, we're accepting of this body uh, as long as we feel that it's, it's behaving responsibly. And what that means is that it's exercising restraint, that it's distancing the individuals on the court in a persuasive way from the substance of the decision. So you win, but not because I like you you know, or, or I think that's what I want the result to be. But you win because that's what I have to decide, because that's what the law compels me to decide. Sometimes it's easy. In non-constitutional cases, it's much easier because we've got a lot more detail in the statutory directives and this sort of thing. Once you get into the Constitution, though, as, as Justin has mentioned, and I mentioned a little while ago, the terminology can be really vague, susceptible of multiple meanings. Um, what does equal protection mean? What are privileges and immunities? What is a Republican form of government? And so where you give that much play space to the judges in interpreting and applying the Constitution, they've got to come up with some persuasive rationale for limiting their scope of action. Now, today, uh, we've got a number of these, and this is sort of constitutional jurisprudence or decision-making methodologies. So we've got a number of these. I'm going to talk in an introductory fashion about two of them, both of which you've heard of. Uh, and then we're going to talk later in the, in the sessions in greater detail about, about some of these uh, and some others in particular. The first that I'm going to talk about is originalism or original intent. Uh, jurisprudence. And, and then the other one is what we call the living constitution, 
this notion that the document evolves over time. Uh, both of these uh, highly politically charged approaches to constitutional decision making. Uh, they're, they're very non-technical. They're very much in the public domain. Uh, if you watch uh, Supreme Court uh, confirmation hearings or presidential debates, invariably the question will come up, well, what do you say? Are you an originalist? Uh, and that appeals to a certain core a political constituency. Do you believe in a living constitution? And that appeals to another uh, core political uh, constituency. Uh, what I want to do is to, is to ex explain sort of what each of these is, is about. Uh, and you'll have a, a, a feel for this already to a certain extent. But then I want to talk about the problems with each of them. Uh, and what I hope to leave you with is, is a sense of, gee, <laughs> neither one of this, these is really maybe as good as, as it should be. Uh, and maybe we should be looking for something else, or maybe, maybe we need to really think about this um, more than, than maybe a lot of folks have. So originalism. What's originalism? What's the predicate for originalism? OK, John Locke, uh, English uh, political philosopher of the 17th century, says uh, societies uh, formed uh, as a result of agreement among the citizens in a particular community. We all get together for what Locke called the social compact or the social contract, where we give up some power to a government, and the government gets to exercise that power as, as long as it's following the rules, it's legitimate, and we'll follow it, uh, et cetera. Many of the, of the founders of the republic were Lockeans. Um, this we the people notion, that's textbook language for the creation of a Lockean social compact. We the people come together, here's the government, here's what we delegate to the national government, now let's sit back and let it, and let it operate. But what does that mean when we come to questions of interpretation of the terms of the deal? Well, what an originalist will tell you is that, that we ought to essentially view a, this, this constitutional compact as, as what it is, which is a compact or a contract. And when we interpret contracts under the common law, the, one of the principal goals is to give intent to the intent of the parties to the contract. And a lot of judges will do that. So you come in with, you know, I have a contract with a guy to mow my lawn. And, and the judge will know, well, what do, you, what do you think this contract meant? And what do you think it meant? And if there's a way to take the words and match our expectations, then that's the result. So an originalist will say, what we're supposed to do with this is figure out what the parties to the Constitution, later in time, if we're talking about amendments or the original text back in 1787 or 88 or whatever, thought it meant, and then enforce that understanding. As a historian, I will tell you this is extremely compelling. I love the idea that folks would have to come to people like me to interpret the Constitution because we don't know what these people thought it meant. But it's problematic, as, as, uh, as enticing as it might be to, to me personally, I have to confess this. It's problematic because, first of all, we aren't really sure who the parties were. If it's a lawn mowing service, we know who they are because we signed it. But who are the parties to the Constitution? The delegates to the Philadelphia Convention, why? They produced a draft that then had to get approved by state ratifying conventions. The state ratifying conventions, why? Because not all of them had the power to make it effective. Nine states had to sign off. So is it the ninth, the New Hampshire ratifying convention? I don't know, but the document says, we the people. So is it everybody? And who's the people? White males? Uh, everybody? Where are we supposed to go to figure, figure that question out? And that's not an easy question to answer. Once we do figure that question out, we've got the question of ascertaining just what the intent of that group was. And I'll tell you, that's not easy. We could agree uh, in, in this circle, in this room, on, on language, big language. And there would be as many different reasons for adopting that language and understandings of what that language meant as there are people in the room. So is it my intent? Is it some composite? And this is especially ex ex uh, exaggerated this problem in the context of the Constitution if we're looking to the framers because they didn't keep records. All we've got is Madison's notes that came out decades later. So we don't really know. We only know what Madison said they debated. So what do we go to? Correspondence, the Federalist Papers, and this is what judges who apply this will, will commonly do. Um, the Federalist Papers, 
are actually advocacy pieces for the Constitution that appeared in newspapers in New York during the New York ratification convention debates. Why do we care what, what they said? I mean, they're well written and very interesting, but why should they have any particular legal power in interpreting what we, the people, intended this document to mean? Um, these are just some suggestions of the problems of actually applying originalism, and I think, I think it, it's a, it, it, it should be a part of the originalist exercise to acknowledge these problems and to, and to try and, and figure out a way to deal with them if you're, if you're committed to that notion. Now, a few brief words about um, the living constitution. All right, this is a solution to the problem of originalism. Two potential predicates. One is, okay, it's a contract, but the contract parties have changed. So I have my lawn mowing deal, and it survives the contract through my kids and your kids, you're the lawn mower, and 200 years later, there's people we can't even imagine who are part of this deal. Why do we care what you and I think it meant? It really should matter just what they think it means in the future. We the people have expanded, we have new parties, so let's look at modern interpretations or beliefs about the values that are enshrined in the text of the Constitution. The supporting argument for that is the framers used really big words susceptible of multiple interpretations. They must have intended that we would do that because they would realize they're not stupid that there's no way for us to figure out what they thought these words meant. Due process? Equal protection? No. Children, grandchildren, you guys wrestle with these from one generation to the next, which actually is consonant with what, uh, what Justin suggested Jefferson's view was about rewriting the Constitution for every, uh, for every uh, generation. But this isn't problem free either, of course, because you say, okay, modern generation, I'm all for that. Well, how do you figure that out? How do we know what the modern generation believes is cruel punishment? I don't know. Again, the problem is if we're looking at our understanding, everybody's got a slightly different view on that. Is it a majority view? Well, that doesn't seem right. Justice Scalia, among others, has, I think, correctly said that his job as a justice is to tell the majority to take a hike. Right? He's protecting the rights of the document and minorities. The majority always wins. That's just legislation. Right? The court's there for another purpose, which is protecting something different. So there are problems with this approach, too. It recognizes changed circumstances. It recognizes the words are susceptible of multiple interpretations. But it's not really clear that it gives us any concrete means that would be satisfying to everybody, or even a majority, of interpreting the Constitution in such a way that we're satisfied the judges are restrained in the exercise of the judicial review power, and not simply coming up with a decision they think is right, and then explaining it by references to other things. Which, by the way, is what opponents of originalist decisions will say. So to finish on this, and as, as I said, we'll, we'll be, both be talking about this a little bit more um, later, what I want to leave you with is not a feeling that you know, one's right and the other's wrong. It's that they're both really, really complicated. And before we embrace one, before we, even worse, start pitching one to everybody else, I think that it, it's only responsible to, to sit down and reflect on the difficulties and, and acknowledge the validity of the other position. Uh, and that's how a democracy is supposed to work anyway, in my view. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from Woody Young, and the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.